Good morning. I want to welcome you here to Cliftondale Congregational Church. I'm Pastor Joe Hoyle. If you're visiting with us today, all we ask is that you take the time to fill out your uh, visitor card. There should be one in the, the front part of your pew. Uh, if you also are a member and have a change of information or a prayer request that you would like to share just privately, you can also fill it out and put that in the uh, offertory, uh, offering plate. But what we want to do today is we want to welcome the Lord into this house and into our presence. So please pray with me. Father, as we come before you, God, we thank you for the opportunity to come in here and to worship you. God, I ask that you will be here in a mighty way, that your spirit will rest on this place and on each and every one of our hearts. God, that you will give us peace, that you'll give us clarity, that you'll give us answers, you'll give us what we seek. Uh, God, I hope that we will become closer to you. May our worship bring us closer to you, attune our hearts to you, and help us also to recognize the many blessings that you give us. God, we thank you that those that sleep in you, we know we will see again. And God, we ask that you be with Becca's family. God, we praise you for uh, the organ working and for people just showing up and, and being willing to get their hands dirty. God, that's, that's what it takes to be the family of God. And, and God, we, we help each other, we grieve together, we have joy together. And God, I just ask that your spirit will be with us as we worship you together. And we ask this now in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please pray with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. you to turn in your hymnal to hymn number 139, Great is Thy Faithfulness, hymn number 139.
pages over to 151, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. 151.
And so I did. And I kind of left them intact. Just to show you what this means to me in this season. You know, I was thinking when I carved my pumpkin one day, what's the first thing you have to do if you're going to make a jack-o'-lantern? What's the first thing? Not put a light in it. How would you get it in there? Pretend I didn't even cut it yet. What do you do? Take out the seeds. How many of you like to do that part? Take out the seeds. <laughs> That's what I have other teachers in my school to do. They like that gooey stuff. I don't like that gooey stuff. But anyway, you cut open the top, right? And you scoop in, clean out all the seeds. And then you start to carve it. So what do we usually carve first? You usually do the mouth first? All right. Okay, come on, work with me. Okay. We'll do it this way. There it is. And then what? What part might you do next, Colin? What do you think? We'll go for the nose. There's the nose. And then, whoops, and then we go for, we'll say the eyes. There's the eye. And you notice sometimes I do draw in my pocket before I cut this to make sure it can look okay. And then there's the other eye. And maybe not always. This one is a big one, yes. It's great because I can keep it here after the Um And then, not always, but some people cut out, look at that, ears. I'm going to hold on to one of these ears. Thank you, buddy. All right, so I have all my pieces cut out, right? And then, what do we do, Mike? Part. What do we do after you cut out all the pieces? Jaden, I think you said it. And I think I need what's in your pocket now. What do we do after we cut out all the pieces? Put a light in it, right? I forgot my candle today, and really I didn't want to put a light in the candle. Um, but we put the light in it so the light shines through. And this reminds me of just what Jesus did for us. If we Receive Jesus as our Savior. He cleans out all the bad stuff about us, cleans our heart, opens our mind, cleans our heart, and puts a smile on our face. And then His Holy Spirit leaves <coughs> inside of us. God bless you. To shine through for everyone to see. When, our, when we shine our light, other people see God's love and they want to know and come to see Christ too. And I said I'm going to find one of these, one of these ear pieces because if you notice, I tried to cut it in the shape of a book because we need to be make sure, making sure that we listen to God's word to know just how we should shine for Him. And just like it says in our Bible, Matthew verse chapter five verse sixteen. The pumpkin was upstairs, yes. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16 says, Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds, and praise your Father in heaven. And I have a little prayer for everybody. As you carve in your pumpkin, you can read, read this prayer with your family. Dear, let us pray. Dear Jesus, open my eyes so that I can learn about you. Take all my sin and forgive the wrong that I do. Open my eyes so your love I will see. I'm sorry for the times I've turned my nose up at what you've given me. Open my ears so your word I will hear. Open my mouth to tell others you're near. Let your light shine in all I say and do. Amen. Dear Lord, sometimes in, in the season of fall, we have all sorts of crazy weather and crazy world events. With uh, Sometimes it seems when we're driving down the street that the whole world is just shaking around us. But we need to remember that you are the one who can bring us peace in this, in this season of turmoil. Um, I pray that you would be with uh, those, those people who are seeking medical care, that you would come alongside them, come alongside their doctors, uh, guide those doctors' hands, and also to guide the thoughts of those who are being treated, that they would remember that you overall have a plan for their life and that draw, drawing closer to you will only be only allows them to become closer to that more perfect plan. Uh, I praise for uh, the response of the DPW workers and also that just your uh, hand of protection over uh, the situation with the tree at the Chan's house. Um, and also um, in this time where 
the victims of the shooting at the synagogue as well as the, uh, the Samson family, that you would just come along those who are mourning this week. Uh, I hope that you would provide them the knowledge of the, your peace that passes understanding and that they uh, have this wonderful counselor and almighty God who comes alongside them in both seasons of joy and in seasons of sadness. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me in the reading of our confession. Lord, forgive us for when we are impatient or take more than we need. Please help us to trust in you to provide for our needs. Help us to be as generous with others as you are with us. Thank you for meeting our needs. In Jesus' name, amen. You may turn your hymnals to hymn number 147. How great thou art. Hymn number 147.
Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give out of our abundance back to your kingdom. God, we ask that you will forward it and multiply it in its power beyond the scope of anything that we would uh, dream for it or expect from it. God, we know that you're able to take what we can give and multiply it beyond what we know uh, is capable. You are more than capable of anything. God, we ask that you will bless both the gift and the giver. And God, that uh, you'll help us also to not just give of our finances, but also of our time to you, as well as our hospitality and, and anything else that you, which you have given, gifted us with. God, thank you again for this opportunity to give back to you, which have, who have given so much to us. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Today's scripture reading is Matthew 6, 25 through 27, and can be found on page 1505 in your pew Bible. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more than valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Here ends the reading. Right. We're going to be continuing in our series in the Lord's Prayer. And we're going to be looking at Matthew 6, verse 11. That's going to be our main verse. And that will be on page uh, 1505 in the Bible. Uh, before we get into, uh, into the message, let us uh, pray. Father, as we come to the reading and the teaching of your word, I ask that you will have nothing more and nothing less uh, be what I say than what you would have me to say. God, I ask that your spirit will go forward, and God, that it will not return void. God, thank you for your word and for this time. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. So how much... Is really enough. What does it really take for us to have enough in our lives? And this is a very crucial and important question for us to ask as people of faith. What does it take to be satisfied? We as Americans are inundated daily with the latest gadget, uh, billboards, commercials, ads, Telling us that we need these certain things, that we need the latest gizmo, we need to eat at this restaurant, we need these things. And we see that enough, we start to agree with them sometimes. But what actually do we need? And that's what this uh, verse of scripture seeks to answer. This is why Jesus gave it. Now, again, we're talking about the Lord's Prayer, and we say this every week, every Sunday. But what I want us to do is to look at this prayer, this ancient, ancient prayer, with fresh eyes, and to see it as a model for how our prayer life is supposed to be. Uh, this is what Jesus intended. So we've talked about last week how we are to revere God as our Father, not just my Father, but as our Father. That means that we're family. That means that He is Father to me and Father to you, and that that is a unifying thing. We have to remember that when we ask for His kingdom to come and, our, and His will to be done, our kingdoms have to fall. So now we're going to talk about verse 11, and it is, Give us today our daily bread. And when we pray this, and when we think about this, usually what conjures up in our mind is the very basic minimum, the bare bone minimum of survival. But I think there is more to this verse than that. And I think that there's a lot more richness to this verse than that. So what exactly is Jesus talking about here? Why should we ask for God to give us our daily bread? Why is bread metaphor for our daily needs. So, as most of you may know, bread is the most basic of foods. 
People have been making bread for thousands of years. It's one of the oldest things in the world. It's one of the easiest things to make. It's one of the cheapest things to make. Um, meat was a luxury. Even in the Bible, we see that, that people didn't kill an animal to eat until they had enough people to eat it because they had no way to refrigerate it. It would go bad. So killing an animal and having meat was a luxury, and it was a, a special occasion. Bread was something that was always available throughout the Bible. And in the Bible, it is used often as a symbol of God's providence. But there's another thing about bread. And I think that most of you might agree. Bread is delicious. I love bread. Uh, Home-baked bread, any kind of bread. I'm Texan, so I love tortillas. And that's pretty close to what they would have. I love naan. I could eat my weight in naan and regret it for a week. <laughs> and bread is not something that really likes me back, but I still eat it. I love it. So bread is also delicious. Bread is also satisfying. Bread is, is pleasant. And I think these two things are, are something that we need to keep in mind when we are looking at what it means to pray for our daily bread. That we're not just praying for a half-hearted handout. We're not praying God just to give us just what we need for us to be quiet. You know, when I was a kid and uh, when uh, we would go to the store, my mom often would buy me what was called a shut-up toy, which was this little car that would get me something I wanted but would make me quiet. God doesn't do that with us. God isn't giving us shut-up bread or anything like that. He's giving us Bread that is good and pleasant. It is basic, it is sustaining, it is satisfying. But at the same time, it is good. And we need to remember that. God doesn't give half-hearted things to his children. And if we are his children, he's going to take care of us. So I want us to turn back into the book of Exodus. Because this also gives us a little bit of uh, insight into this verse. And in the book of Exodus, in chapter 16, which is going to be on page uh, 113, 112, 113 in your pew Bible. People who heard him say, give us this day our daily bread, would immediately think of this story. And some of you may know this story. Uh, but to provide context, in the Old Testament, the Hebrews, who are the ancestors of Jewish people, were in slavery in Egypt. They were slaves. They were forced to build cities. They were forced to build infrastructure. Uh, they were slaves to the Pharaoh in Egypt. God rose up Moses, and Moses freed them, and led them out of Egypt into the wilderness in what is today modern-day Israel. But the people started grumbling. The people started complaining because they had meat, Every day, they had a small amount of luxury every day. Even though they were slaves, they longed for the familiar, comfortable uh, situation that they had in Egypt. But instead of, of, of being free, they wanted to go back to being slaves and being comfortable. So this is what God does. In verse uh, 11 of chapter 16, it says, The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. And that evening quail came and covered the camp. In the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, then flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Each one of you is to gather as much as he needs. Take an omer to each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some gathered little. And when they measured it by the omer, he who had gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. Each one gathered as much as he needed. So God provided food.
food in the desert. He provided it for them every day, daily. Uh, he provided quail as a meat. Uh, quail is pretty good. I've had it. Tastes like chicken, just like most things. But it's good. And then he gave this bread, this, uh, this flour that covered the ground miraculously. It looked like coriander seed, the Bible says. And it tasted like a honey wafer. So even though it was a basic food, even though it was a basic thing, it was pleasant. It was good. And this is how God provided each and every day. And, and the one condition was they couldn't gather too much. They couldn't gather more than they needed. If they, used, if they didn't use all of it, it would go bad. The next day it would be uh, rotten. But when they went out and they gathered it, no matter what they gathered, they had enough. And they were satisfied. And this is what would be conjured up in the minds of the people hearing Jesus. That, that story of God providing for the Israelites, their ancestors, each and every day, taking care of them in the wilderness. And that brings us to our time. That when God looks at what we need, and God knows that we need things, and he wants to provide for those needs, he's not going to provide low-quality things. He's not going to provide just the basic thing. He's going to provide good things. Again, it may not be what we necessarily want. It may not be what we necessarily expect or even desire. But it will be more than enough. It will be satisfying. It will be good. And that's what Jesus is saying. God wants us to be nourished. God wants us to be sustained. He wants us to be fulfilled. He wants us to live in abundance. One of my favorite verses in all the scripture is John 10.10. 10. Jesus said that I came to give life and give it abundant. And that sometimes that gets twisted that that means material with riches or anything like that. I, that, is, that is not what that means. But what it does mean is that God wants us not to be ascetics. God doesn't want us to walk around like we're going to a funeral. He wants us to walk around like we're going to a wedding, like we're going to a party. He wants us to be happy and satisfied. And he's going to give us those things that are going to satisfy us. And ultimately, this is a question of contentment. And contentment is an idea that gets spread all over the Bible. Uh, and it's something that is espoused in the New Testament by the Apostle Paul. But what exactly is Contentment. Contentment usually means that you are settling for something. That's how we interpret it. If, well, you know, I'm content with whatever. That usually means, well, I really don't like that, but I guess it's okay. But that's a different thing. That's settling. And God isn't asking us to settle, but he is saying that he is going to give us contentment. And so contentment is placing yourself in a spot in your life where you are free to receive God's best and live most abundantly and being grateful. It is basically being optimal. It is being where you have everything that you need and the freedom to worship God and, and be satisfied. It is balance. A lot of people are often tied down to things that they don't need to be. A lot of times we tie ourselves down to material things, we tie ourselves down to jobs, we tie ourselves down to all kinds of things that don't deserve our allegiance, that do not deserve us to be giving them that much energy. And it's cutting into our freedom and our ability to have the abundant life that God wants to have. And again, this doesn't, this isn't health and wealth, this isn't anything like that, because I, I, we're going to get into that even in the valley, even in the dark times, you can still have contentment. Even when things are less than ideal, you can still have contentment. You can still have abundance. But you have to really understand what that means and what that abundance is. And it's not material wealth. But we have this opportunity to live in freedom. We have this opportunity that Christ has given us to live in freedom to live a life with God, connected with God, and to have our needs met. To have a satisfying life, to have community, to have family, 
to not be alone. To have somebody that when you fall on hard times, they're going to pick you up. That's what the church is for. That's what we are here for each other. So, ultimately, the result of this prayer is contentment, which is equated to, to satisfaction that is also coupled with hope. It's not just hoping that we get the basics. It's not just hoping that we get some stale bread. It's hoping we're going to get fresh bread and that things will be better and things are going to get better. All of us, most of us probably know the 23rd Psalm. And I want us to turn there because I think that this explains further just this idea of what contentment looks like and what fulfillment looks like and what the result of this prayer, of what giving us our daily bread really means. And uh, that's on page 862 in your pew Bible. But let's, let's just read through it, uh, uh, and then we'll, we'll go through it. So it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We know this psalm, and this is often prayed, but we have to remember that this psalm is a psalm of David. David had people that wanted to kill him. David had people that wanted to depose him. David did not have an easy life, but yet he was able to pray this prayer that even in the midst of all this turmoil in his life, whatever the circumstances beyond his control were, that he still had this peace and this contentment. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. If the Lord is my shepherd, that means that I'm the sheep. And that means that if he makes me lie down in green pastures, that means that there's enough for me to eat. It's also there's enough for me to rest. The same with beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He guides me in the way that I need to go. He doesn't let me get lost. He's not going to lose me. He's not going to, I'm not going to fall away because he's going to, he's going to guide me. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for your rod and your staff that come for me. God will fight for me. I'm not even, it's not even up to me to fight my own battles. God will fight my battles for me. Ultimately, God is walking with me and I am not in the valley alone. God is still there. He is still providing for me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. For David, this was literal enemies. For us, it may be addiction. It may be any number of things. But God's given us victory over that. He's working to bring us victory over that. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that is kind of the rub, because ultimately the key to our daily bread is God himself. Jesus called himself the bread of life. Jesus called himself the, the, the bread of life that, that, that people are to come and have their fill and be satisfied. God, throughout scripture, tells us to come and see and taste that he is good to experience it. He uses this metaphor of food that God satisfies us, that he will provide for us in all things. Ultimately, our daily bread is God himself. And that's the key. That's how, even in the hard times, even when we're going through illness, even when we're going through difficulty, even when there may be less than what we would like, God is still going to provide for us because he loves us. If we are following after him, that is a guarantee. He is going to give us our daily bread, and namely, that is also himself. 
is going to give us the peace to walk through that valley. He is not going to go, he, he's not going to let us go through that valley alone. We each are driven to worship something. We each are driven to worship something. And a lot of people try to fill that hole that only God can fill with other things. They fill it with jobs. They fill it with people. They fill it with things, material things. And none of these things are bad, but they don't, they don't make very good gods. Only God can be God. And when God is in his proper place, and we're worshiping, and we're where we need to be, then there is nothing that we could want. We are ultimately satisfied, even in the hard times. This is how Paul, even in a prison cell, could say that he's content that he is satisfied, that God has given him his daily bread because God himself is sustaining him from day to day. And part of that is in the fact that he probably did have food to eat. He probably did have his basic needs met, but also God was with him. He had the gospel. He had the hope of the gospel. In Philippians 4, 11 to 13, you don't need to turn there, but these are the words of Apostle uh, Paul or St. Paul. And the, the interesting idea about contentment, the interesting idea about the daily bread that God wants to give us is that contentment is learned. It's not something that we naturally are born with. It's something that we learn. And he said, I am not saying this because I am in need. This is the words of, of Paul. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret to being content in any and every situation whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Paul's strength in daily bread was first God himself. He trusted God to provide for him. And God did. And ultimately, the worst this world can do to us is kill us. But even then, for us in Christ, we gained a victory. We gained a victory of victories. Whatever this world throws at us, hardship, illness, whatever it may be, it will not conquer us because we are more than conquerors in Christ. We will be victorious, ultimately, no matter what happens, no matter what we lose, no matter where we are in life, we have God, and that is the most important thing today. So... I want to close today with a few questions. Where are you today? Are you satisfied in God? When you ask for your daily bread, are you expecting just the bare minimum? Or are you looking further? Are you looking deeper to God? I want to be satisfied in you. I want to be content in you. Again, that doesn't mean that we're just resigning ourselves to faith. That's not what this is. It's not stoicism. It's we are giving ourselves over to God saying, I trust you because you are faithful. And I know that if I'm in the valley, better days are coming. And ultimately, I have an eternity with you where I will never experience hardship, pain, or death, or anything. So whatever this world may do to me, I'm satisfied in you. I am going to follow after you. I am going to find my identity in you. And I am not going to attach my worth or my satisfaction or my fulfillment or my value to things that are lesser than you. Because when we do that, we ultimately create a prison for ourselves. So as we come to a season of Thanksgiving, as we look ahead, as we start thinking about what we've been provided for. I think most of us could probably say that we have what we need. And ultimately, that if we have discontent in our life, it may mean that we have too much. It may mean that we need to make some room so that way we can allow God to satisfy us. For me, it took a long time to get to a point where I understood what this meant. And it, it took a lot of counting and, and, and some pruning in my life. But ultimately, whatever I have given up, whatever I have lost, whatever I have put aside, 
more has come back. I had been in a better position to receive what God ultimately wanted me to have and wanted to satisfy me with than whatever else I was chasing. And that is what God promises for us today. God promised us a future and a hope and a place where we are going to be completely whole. And right now, in this world, in this day, today, wherever we are in our circumstances, we can be whole. We can be completely whole. And that is what God wants to give us. He wants to give us freedom. And that is what the daily bread means. That's why it's a metaphor. Bread is basic, but bread is good, and bread is satisfying. And bread, ultimately, is also nourishing. And that's what God wants us. He wants us to be nourished, and even in the less than ideal circumstances, we can still have that. So where are you? Are you where you need to be to be able to receive that satisfaction from God and God alone? Or are there things in the way? The sooner that we're able to make room for that, the sooner we're able to properly align ourselves, the better we will be and the more satisfied we will be. And God is longing to give it to us because he's a good father. And he wants to give us his best and the good things. And he wants to give us that abundant life that ultimately is only found in him. So with that, let us pray. Father, thank you for being a God who is a father. He doesn't just give handouts, but is intimately, accessibly thinking of us. Who are we as human beings that you would even worry about us? A universe bigger than we can fathom. Why, why do we matter? But we do. Thank you, God, for satisfying us. Thank you, God, for life. Thank you, God, for the daily bread that you give us. Thank you for the friends in our lives, for the relationships in our lives that sustain us and nourish us. Thank you for the church that functions as a family. Help us, God, if there's any fat in our life that we need to trim, God, help us to trim it. So that way, we can be more free. Maybe we need to give up things in order to be abundant. Maybe it's not quantity, but maybe it's quality. Maybe it's a matter of focus. Whatever it may be, God, whatever changes we need to make, that we can be in a position to get this nourishing, fulfilling and satisfying bread from you each and every day. God, I pray that we'll make those changes. And God, when we are receiving it, I pray that we'll also recognize it and be thankful for it. But God, thank you for sustaining us. Thank you for nourishing us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
Father, as we go from these uh, doors, as we go into a meeting to decide, I ask for wisdom. I ask God for your grace and your peace to be upon us and for your clarity and for your will, God, to be made known to us. God, I ask that wherever we go throughout this week, God, that you'll just help us to be a blessing to those who need it. Help us to carry your gospel from this place into the streets of Saugus and Boston, wherever else we may be. God, I just thank you for this time to worship together. We ask all this in your son's name. Amen.